Hey, today we are going to speak about social relationships in surveillance, automation, and algorithmic living. Lauren Lee McCarthy, today's guest, is an artist who will fascinate you with the way she thinks about technology. Why did she create a human version of Alexa? How did she use Amazon Talk to manage her dating life? And what happens when instead of having a digital follower, you are actually getting a real one? All of these questions will be discussed today. So let's start. We are being told to choose between the left and right brain, between studying art and engineering, between creative and analytical thinking. Our society tells us that art and business are not connected. But what if society is wrong? What if it misleading us? The good news is that understanding what art is can bring us to a new revelation. Art does matter in innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. And with the help of this podcast and its guests, you as well will learn that art is not an object. Art is a mindset. You are listening to the Artian Podcast with me, Nir Hindi. You can say, do I have any notifications? Has anyone tagged me? Has anyone liked my post? You can say, play the song of the day. This is Lauren McCarthy's voice. Play the last song. She's captivated by how we are taught to interact with algorithms and how this shapes the way we interact with each other. Her works challenge our basic beliefs on technology. They raise questions and allow a different perspective for humans in a technological world. She is a 2021 United States Artist Fellow, 2020 Sunday's New Frontier Story Lab Fellow, 2020 iBeam Rapid Response Fellow, and many, many more, in addition to everything she does. She is the creator of the P5JS, an open source art and education platform with millions of users. She is active in many fields that revolve around software, electronics, the internet, and of course, humans. Before we start, I want to say big thanks to James George, who actually introduced me to Lauren. So James, if you are listening, it's because of you that we are here. Thank you. Hey, Lauren, welcome to the RTN podcast. Hi, happy to be here. Lauren, can you take a moment and introduce yourself briefly? My name is Lauren Lee McCarthy, and I am an artist working with software and performance and installation, and I'm based in Los Angeles, California. First of all, you know, I heard you for the first time when you had a podcast at Y Combinator, the famous accelerator podcast, and then James George, and thank you very much, James, that was interviewed to this podcast actually connected us. I find your work fascinating, really. It's not a compliment. It's just a fact. It deals with so many topics that I'm interested in. And I'm interested, what are you searching in your art? I'm really interested in the ways that we form relationships with one another and how that is happening in the midst of the surveillance and data and network culture that we're a part of. So I think that there are both positives and negatives about that, but I'm in my art always looking for ways to just kind of question that and open up spaces where we can really reflect on what's happening and how we want to relate to one another in our lives. <laughs> Every work that you, you do at least make me think, and I'm interested, what do you hope to achieve when people actually interact with your artworks? I'm fairly critical of a lot of technology. I tend to look at them and see the problems or the inequities. Another thing I notice is that a lot of times we are presented with new technologies and, and asked to respond really quickly to buy it or to be outraged or to like it or whatever the response is. It feels like there's not enough time to really think and that we're, we're supposed to think these things are black and white when they're not. So... I guess what I'm hoping in my work, even though I have my own critical perspective, is not necessarily to tell people to think or feel a certain way, but to open up a space where they feel like they can start to tease some of these things apart and decide for themselves how they feel. So I'm really trying to create a space for people to question and also foster a sense of agency where it really feels like we can all be a part of these conversations about where we're going instead of just having to have it served to us from whatever company is producing the technology. 
I totally relate to that. Every time there is a new app, it's only by invitation and they kind of create this sense of urgency that you have to do it now or you miss the opportunity of your life to be addicted to another one. And every platform have their own 20 second story or 30 second story or 60 second story. And I feel that I'm working for those technologies, but I find it very difficult to disconnect from it. What we can, what we can do about it. Yeah, I feel it too, especially now. Your devices are your portal to other people most of the time when you can't even gather in person. I mean, I think, again, it comes back to feeling a, some sense of control or some both like a knowing how and also a believing that you deserve to be able to set some boundaries or some guidelines for how you want these tools to intersect with your life. I really think that starts with just having the time and space to understand what it is that's happening and reflect on how it's shaping your life. I think art can be a way of doing that where you're not like reading just like a Twitter rant or something or a medium post, but you're actually just interacting and seeing how literally how you feel and how that's kind of shaking things up for you. And I think that can be a first step. And then from there, you might say, okay, well, this is what's okay with me. This is what's not. How do I orient my life around those sorts of values or decisions or boundaries I'm setting for myself? We will get to that in a second, because I remember in our last conversation, you mentioned that you envy Alexa with the project that you are doing. But before that, you started to speak about connection. And obviously, you just mentioned that these devices are the portal to connections with others. And your works often touches this connection. I'm interested, how do you find connections over this virtual world? Or what does it take? maybe, to feel connection? It's such a good question. I think a lot of times we confuse bandwidth or fidelity with connection, that maybe if we have more hours of video streaming, then I'll feel closer to you. And, and often I feel like it's almost the opposite. <laughs> like the more hours of Zoom I have, the more disconnected I sometimes feel from everyone. So I think part of it is, how do you find connection? I think part of it is being intentional about the time that you spend and the kind of energy and throughput that you're putting out there, feeling like you can just set some boundaries for your life. I think right now, especially it's like a situation where that feels really hard to do. People know where you're at at every moment, <laughs> you're behind your computer. But then I think it's, so that's one part, right? It's like finding, figuring out how to work these technologies in a way that works for us. I think the second is like connection really involves tapping into some sense of vulnerability and offering some of yourself to another person. And that sounds great, but it's not necessarily our normal mode of interaction. We're, we're much more defensive, rightly so sometimes. But I guess I'm always wondering, how do you open up these moments of destabilizing things enough so that we don't just fall into the patterns of like, okay, here's what we need to do to get from like morning to night. But we have times where we can bend the rules a little bit or end up in a conversation space that is just a little bit unexpected. And so I think in my work, I'm often trying to do that. I'm like tweaking both the technical and the social rules around that particular situation and hoping that somewhere in that, the, both the freedom of some of the rules shifting, but also the shared awkwardness or discomfort of not quite knowing how to behave, something you know, interesting could emerge and that could be, bring people closer. I'm very much interested to hear maybe an example of one of your work. I'm just raising the question, is the work Social Turkers, if I pronounce it correctly, deals with connection? Yeah, definitely. I, that was my goal. Social Turkers was an earlier work from 2013. It was right around the time that Google Glass was coming out, if you remember that. Yeah. So, so people were very outraged about this idea that everyone would have a camera on them at all times. And there were these surveillance questions. But for me, I was like, okay, well, we're already carrying a camera. I have my phone. What about the fact that you could be receiving information at any time and nobody would really know? And so that was sort of what I was thinking about. And at the same time, I'm always like, I guess I see my life as the kind of test bed for these ideas a lot of times or the material. So I was just thinking about dating, which was something I was struggling with at the time and specifically online dating, which was a little bit newer. So I basically, I went on a series of date online dates I met with people I met online. And I use this service called Amazon Mechanical Turk. And Mechanical Turk is a website run by Amazon where you can post small jobs 
for people to do for small amounts of money. So it's usually used for things that like a human could do really easily, but a computer might have a harder time with, like transcribe this audio or tag this image, kind of these simple tasks like that. So in my case, I applied it to my dating life. So I went on these dates and I would stream video from our date to the web live. And then I would pay workers on this platform to watch and direct me what to say and do. And I would get these directions via text message and I had to kind of perform them immediately. So they might say, move closer to him or stop talking about yourself so much or, or say this or do that. And so it was kind of an experiment to see if, I don't know, like giving, like what does it mean to bring this, these outside, to bring the network into a relationship, I guess. And then there were a lot of questions obviously around labor and consent and surveillance as well. That was the project. And how did your dates respond to that? Did they know that, that you are getting instruction from the outside? Yeah, I think when, when I would like bring this up with them, I mean, it's always really different for everyone, but it was tricky because a lot of people then would kind of shift into, well, they'd become very self-conscious and they also would, often the date, instead of being just like a normal date, would suddenly become all about talking about this project, which wasn't really the point of it. So I had to kind of find creative ways to work with that or... tell people at the end of the date and things like that, where for me, it raised a lot of like ethical questions, especially around surveillance and privacy. And it was really just like a product of trying to navigate in that moment and figure out what felt right and what felt honest or not. But I think what guided me was that I was really like earnestly, it wasn't just for an art project. I think that's true of a lot of my work. I was like actually looking for someone to date and I actually ended up meeting my partner through the project. So I use that as a guidepost when I was trying to navigate to say like, look, I'm not trying to like use people for an art product here or mislead them just for the point of art. I think that there's something deeper that I'm trying to find here. Amazing. So at the end, it's kind of, you found your partner through this experiment, human experiments. I won't call it an artwork now. I'll change the language. Sure. I'm interested. What do you think about all the Tinder and Bumble of the worlds today? <laughs> I think those are a necessity right now. It's so hard to meet people. I mean, I think that compared to when I was, even when I was doing this project in 2013, which was still dating apps have been around or sites have been around for a while. I think the stigma has like really gone away. We really understand that there are a lot of different ways to meet people and connect with people. And that could be digital or it could be physical. I mean, I think overall, that's a positive thing. I think on the other hand, what I see happening is people kind of like swiping through things. It feels like there's like an endless feed of people. So it, like you never, it can feel hard to settle because you're like, well, maybe if I just keep looking through this, I'll find the next one that's even better. And it feels different than in physical life where you're like, well, there's so many people in the city and how many of them am I going to meet? So I, I think that's a challenge that we're dealing with in general, not just with dating, but like how do we maintain this feeling of, like each individual person and their their importance and their presence and not see them as like, oh, you're just one more Zoom call or you're one more email in my inbox or you're one more square on my Tinder screen, you know. Be in the moment. Be with the person. Yeah. And I think part of it is just like there's such an influx of people and communication. So it really takes us being more conscious about like who are we holding space and time for to do that. I don't know if I read it or someone told me the story that Think about even how we ask people, how are you? It's just, okay, how are you? It's just part of the conversation. But they did, I think, a research that they actually showed that if you actually say, how are you? Just change the tone. You can actually change the whole conversation because suddenly it's not how are you, just part of, hey, good morning. It's actually paying attention to you, if that makes sense. Your work also deals with intimacy. And I wonder, maybe you can share one of your work that actually deals with intimacy Because you have so many. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm always thinking about. Like, yeah. do I, I, I don't know what to choose. I just will encourage listeners, go check uh, Lorraine's uh, website and we will add the links because it's like a whole library of human experiments. I don't know if no, and now that you said it, I don't know if I can call them artworks anymore. It's so beautiful there. Maybe you can share with us one of the work that you liked around intimacy and technology. One reason that I'm so fascinated by intimacy in my work is because I feel like I'm someone that has a difficult time 
socially, especially when I'm first meeting people. It's like some people have that ease and I feel like I'm sort of on the opposite end. So I'm always uh, trying to crack that code of like, how do you get close to someone? Because for me, it happens sometimes, but I don't know like, what did I do? Or how do I do that again, you know? <laughs> and so it, what it feels like, and then I see the way that I'm kind of like defeating myself a lot of times because I have so much anxiety about this. And so a lot of these projects feel like these attempts to just kind of like hack the situation, like from a, you know, hacking from a software perspective is just like trying to find sort of an exploit or another way into the situation. So I'm trying, I'm almost like using that kind of like logical part of my brain to figure out if there's some other way to, to go about this. So I wake up, I get dressed, I go out, I do things. I read a magazine and I find out about people. Why do I know about their lives? One of the projects that comes to mind is for a few years ago, it's called Follower. And the concept was just, it's a service that provides a real life follower for a day. So people could go and sign up on a website and download an app. And the app would just uh, notify them one day when they woke up, you're now being followed. And it was like a one day performance. So then their phone would start broadcasting their GPS data to a person that was physically following them throughout the day, like down the street or into the grocery store, wherever they go. And then at the end of the day, it would notify them, you're no longer being followed. And they'd get one photo that was taken during the day. And so in most, almost every case, I was the follower, which is not something that I, the people necessarily knew. So they didn't know they were looking out for me. Usually they wouldn't, some people would notice their follower during the day or notice me and others would remain um, clueless the whole time. But for me, it was such a nice project because it was like, I got to spend (laughs) <laughs> this whole day with this person and get pretty close to them and like close in physical sense, but also close in the sense of just like seeing, getting this perspective on how they live without having to talk to them. But I mean, <laughs> yeah. so that was a relief for me, but also like some in that lack of communication or interaction, I think something else emerged. And this is something I play with a lot. It's just like the imagination of the other person can come, can sometimes be even more than, the presence or the person themselves. So we aren't speaking and we aren't interacting, but I spend my whole day imagining and trying to like extrapolate who is this person that I'm following. And similarly, they may or may not see me, but they're, they know that there's a person there and they kind of feel that presence. And they're also thinking, who is this person following me? What are they thinking as they're watching? Where can I take them? Sometimes they would become almost like a dance, like they would almost take me on a tour of their city or something. So I like to go back to that project because it, for me, it's one of the most intimate, yet there was so much distance. We're not having interaction. So it really like reconfigured my ideas of presence or what closeness or intimacy can mean. It's very interesting because it's in, in a way, what I hear from you, there are positive sides for this project. And I'm also thinking about what might be the negative sides. And it's kind of remind me, I saw David Letterman uh, show and he hosted uh, Kim Kardashian. And she actually told the story when she was robbed in Paris. And apparently they followed her pictures where she was located all the time. So they all the time knew basically where she was. And sometimes I, I wonder if the producers of Black Mirror are following your work because it seems like a perfect theme for episodes. Yeah, it's funny. After I did the Social Turkers project, I think like a year later, their Christmas special was all about this idea of someone watching in to a date and, and directing them. It's funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's in the zeitgeist. I always swing back and forth. For me, my projects are very... I feel that they're very critical, but it, there's always some part that's kind of about hope. And otherwise, for me, that feels like a difference with Black Mirror, that I watch that show and I often feel sort of hopeless or depressed. And I think and I think there's a, a useful place for that. But in terms of my work, I feel like I have to have something in it that feels kind of hopeful for me. Otherwise, I don't. it doesn't feel worth it for me to just create another kind of dystopia we have so many already existing. <laughs> so if I'm going to actually enact this thing, I, I don't want to just put people through an experience that's just completely critical or negative. But yeah, I mean, so I swing back and forth. I can focus on these moments and these projects where there's something really exciting. It feels like there's some kind of breakthrough in terms of interaction. But on this other hand, 
yeah, the whole premise of it is very problematic. I think another thing people feel in addition to just intimacy is like, oh man, like my point was your phone is broadcasting this data all the time, but you don't normally feel so aware of the that vulnerability or that lack of privacy, right? As you do in the moment when I'm following you down the street. So a lot of times I think I'm trying to make these human metaphors to help us understand they're like these systems that are just larger than ourselves that become that I think are just hard to have an intuition for. And so through these performances, I'm hoping that like by making it more literal, like I'm literally a person walking data, walking down the street, maybe that puts a face to it where they can say like, oh, maybe I want to set some boundaries there. Maybe I'm not okay. Yeah, totally. Because the culture we are living is more likes, more followers, more uh, shares. And suddenly thinking that I will have 10 or 20 or three people below my building waiting to follow me <laughs> Makes me anxious. Yeah, yeah. Before we talk about your work, Lorraine, when you actually transform yourself to a human version of Alexa, let's take a short break. Would you like to work personally with Nier to develop and grow your artistic mindset? At the Artian, we work with organizations and individuals to achieve greater success. Through our art-based leadership sales and innovation training, we show organizations that there is another way of thinking and another possibility of acting. Visit us at www.theartian.com. That is T-H-E-A-R-T-I-A-N.com to learn more. You can say what time is it. You can say what day is it. You can say when I'm I super doing? fascinated by the project that you did what when you became the human version of the Amazon Alexa. Lauren has recommended that I get a haircut every three weeks, and let me tell you, it's helped with my uh, my self esteem a lot. I am able to. Can you tell us about this project and then why actually doing it? So the project is called Lauren, and basically, it was an attempt to become. Alexa to become a human smart home, essentially. And so people could sign up to get the service called Lauren in their homes. And then I would come and install a series of custom network devices like uh, cameras, microphones, door locks, switches, and other appliances. In total strangers' houses. Yes. Yeah. And with, I mean, it's important to say I would do it with their consent, but also with their oversight. So I'm installing these things and they knew where everything was. I mean, I would leave and I would remotely watch the feeds and watch over them for basically 24 hours a day. Like anytime they were awake, I would be watching and I would also be controlling their home. So I could change the lights or unlock the door or turn on the faucet or any, depending on what I had installed in their house. And they could ask me to do things, but I could also kind of try to, I'd like to think that I was like better than an AI because I could understand them as a person. So I would often take action without them asking, just deciding like, oh, I think they need this right now. Like what? Can you give us an example? You know, like looking up a, a recipe or suggesting something for dinner if they seemed a little bit hungry. <laughs> or just setting the ambience of a, a room at specific moments. Or even like going so far as to like order deliveries or things to their house. Every performance is really specific to the individuals living there. So the whole thing would last somewhere between like three days and a week. And then I would deinstall and leave and that, that was sort of the performance. So it immediately invites the question, why doing it? Why you actually transform yourself to a human, I don't know if to call it surveillance, but a, a human Alexa? Yeah, I think it, the project started thinking about when Alexa was really starting to become a bigger thing. Like I was noticing every box from Amazon came with this like Alexa tape trying to convince you to buy it. And I was just thinking so much about how like it's marketed as this utilitarian device, like a speaker you can talk to, but the space it invades is so personal. It's your home. It feels like it's maybe if it's one step further than just your phone in your pocket. It's the space that you live in. It's where you grow up. It's where you learn to be a person. And I just felt like we weren't talking about that enough. Like what is this boundary that's being crossed? So that's kind of where, what I was thinking about. And I, again, my intention was to create a situation where we could really reflect on that and, and grapple with it on human terms. On the other hand, there was like purely selfish motivations, which are just like, I was seeing Alexa get this kind of intimate access to people's lives where they just invite her in and then just like share every detail of their lives with her. And just thinking without any need to do any kind of like getting to know them or anything, it's just like, boom, she's in there. So 
I was kind of just totally jealous. I was like, I want someone to invite me into their home and just like share themselves with me like that. So it was, a, again, it was kind of a hack. And I was like, I wonder if I made myself into a smart home, if I would also get that kind of access. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I wonder, what did you discover about people? The fact that they know that now it's not necessarily an algorithm that is a human. Did you feel that they are more reluctant to share or more open to share? Or what was some of your discoveries? It varied so much between people and it also varied at different moments or for different things. So I think one thing I noticed across the board is people were more, much more patient. They would ask me to turn on the lights and I'd hit the wrong button or there'd be a bug in the software I'd written and like the hairdryer would turn on and be like, oh, sorry, let me fix that one second. And they were just understanding about it or that was part of the charm maybe was like them imagining me on the other end, like trying to keep this thing going. Whereas with a lot of bots or things like Alexa, where it's so impatient, where it's just like, come on, understand me. I don't understand is a phrase meaning indicates that this. So that was something I noticed. I think another thing was people would kind of float between seeing and relating to me as a person and relating to me as an AI. They knew the setup, but depending on the moment, they could kind of put themselves in different head spaces. I think especially because I made like a digital voice based on my own. So I was trying to create this sense of distance where it didn't feel like I was just like in the corner, like, hey, what's up? But um, they felt like they could just relax and do it and like not have to attend to me. So I think what I noticed in the interactions is some of them were very system like Lauren, turn on the lights or change the music, or whatever. And like no feeling no need to have a conversation with me about it. They could just order me around. But other times it would get very human or we'd have a conversation as they're falling asleep or something, or they would ask me for relationship advice or even ask me to like intervene during a relation or during a date and try to push things in a certain direction. So sometimes you became a, a reminder. Sometimes you became an advisor. Yeah. You did it in different places around the world, right? Yeah. And every person was so different. I remember one, when people sign up, they have to say like, why, why would you like to have Lauren in your home? And one person even wrote, like, I'm thinking about getting Alexa, and I thought I would try this first. <laughs> Which I'm like, I'm sure I'm going to sell you on that, but okay, you're doing your research. <laughs> and at the end, I wonder if they got the Alexa. I don't know. <laughs> I should follow up and find out. <laughs> follow up and let me know. And I remember one funny story that you told me that happened to you in Amsterdam with Lauren. Yeah. I guess we were talking about, oh, yeah, like the sense of, Like in one hand, it's very playful. I'm just a presence. And then at other times I became aware of kind of the stakes of this positionality and the responsibilities. And so one moment that happened was in Amsterdam where I was doing it in a home and it had all been installed remotely because I wasn't physically there. And so I had shipped all the things. And before that, I'd only done it in the U.S. So everything was installed and running. But I remember like listening or watching and thinking like, wow, that hairdryer is like making a weird noise. And then I was like, oh, wait, what about the power situation? I didn't like include converters. And then I'm like remembering or realizing that the, the voltage is very different in, the, in Europe versus the US. And so I was like, oh, no, I need to like tell them to like turn everything off for a second so we can fix this issue. And then at that moment, like everything goes dark, like all my cameras turn off and, and like I can't connect to their house at all. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, should I just like, like what happened? Like, oh, my God, what? <laughs> so everything just like melt down over there and so there's like 10 minutes where i'm just like oh god what happened and then it turned out the lights came back on and they were fine it turned out it was like something their child had like flipped a switch or something that had turned off the power in their house but i think there were moments like that where i was like oh yeah i'm actually have a lot of control and not just conceptually but literally i have the switches to their home or the, the possibility to intervene in really big ways and again it goes back to alexa right like we can think of it as just a a small device in the corner, but it is really shaping, it has a huge impact to really shift or affect our lives and ourselves. I want to add another layer to the conversation. Maybe you will find it interesting. Someone very dear to my heart doesn't bring Alexa home because she doesn't want her kid to learn to speak to Alexa that have a woman voice in a tone of ordering. So she doesn't want, he will learn to speak to women in command. So I don't know, maybe we'll add another layer. You mentioned ambience and creating ambience. And I'm holding in my hand the book Real Feeling. And it's an exhibition that now you are part of and touring uh, Europe. Over there, you did a work that called Vibe Check. 
And in a way, I don't know, it's kind of setting our own personal ambience. What is this vibe check? How did you get to this work? Yeah. So vibe check is a collaboration with Kyle McDonald. And it is sort of a continuation of a lot of ideas that we had worked on in some earlier projects around sort of the surveillance and data as it relates to kind of intimate relationships or the way that we interact with one another. So in this piece, people walk into the gallery and there are these little cameras installed throughout the whole show. And it's basically capturing photos of people interacting with each other and analyzing who in the gallery right now is making other people have the most reaction. Like, so for example, if you see a photo and everybody's looking very disgusted and then there's one person that seems to be the cause of that. So it's kind of aggregating all of these moments as people move throughout the space and trying, creating almost this leaderboard of like, who in here is the one that when people are around them, they feel the most angry or the most sad or the most gleeful. And then as people walk out through the exit, they see this leaderboard and these photos, the different actors in the space. So it's really meant to like make us reflect, especially in the pandemic as tracking and surveillance have been increasingly utilized. There's also been this kind of passive observation of just like our neighbors, right? Where you're kind of like, whoa, what are you doing? Or, oh, I see you have a friend over, huh? And you're kind of modeling constantly. And you're asking, are they a threat? Or is this person that lives next door to me actually the key to me, like retaining some sense of humanity? So Vibe Check is meant to kind of talk about those issues of like, yeah, we can keep our distance in this gallery and we can wear masks and not touch each other, but we are constantly having an effect on all the people around us. So what does it mean to kind of track and analyze that? In the case of COVID, we're doing it on a biological level in terms of a, a virus, in terms of the effect that we're causing. So that's sort of the long explanation of the piece. I think another thing we're interested in is just like setting up the space throughout the gallery where the piece isn't in one, it's kind of like every moment you're sort of a part of it, you're interacting with it. So it's kind of a emotion tracker and kind of a self-reflection that I see that you actually understand I'm angry, that I, you understand I'm sad. Maybe instead of just having a mirror in our home, we should have this smart mirror that show us how we look when we are sad. And so it's kind of when everyone say a smile is just two dots up to change your mindset. I really like it. You mentioned the pandemic and I have to ask you something because you deal a lot with human intimacy and the role of human in technology. Personally, I feel that before the pandemic, every company, every software all the time praised the software, praised the technology. It was human in the service of technology. But I feel that the pandemic, at least I hope, changed this notion and kind of put human back in the center. What do you think? Hmm. Oh, man, that's such a tough question. Yes, we are at the center of these technologies now. And I think it's really causing a reckoning of how do we want to interact with technologies and how do we want them mediating our interactions with each other? And we're forced to reckon with that because that is what's happening every day, right? At the same time, I feel like there's such a need for connection psychologically, but also just like pragmatically to do work that it feels to some extent that we're really at the mercy of a lot of these systems. So you can file complaints about Zoom or whatever Clubhouse or whatever app you're using, and they seem to be somewhat reactive because they generally want customers and investors, but it's not a democracy. So it's not like we get to vote. And it's so urgent. It's not like, okay, we'll plan this tool and we'll use it in a year. They're rolling out updates now. And there are some really big problems in terms of privacy and accessibility and yeah, just things that haven't really been thought through. So yes, I think we're definitely more at the center of things, but does that being centered give us more of a sense of power or control over how the technologies work? I'm not sure. Yeah. So I have a question over here because we talked about it. There is something popular today that everyone speak in the world of technology and business, human-centric design. And everyone wants to be centric to the customer, I would claim most of the time without listening to the customer. And what I say is that we need to listen more to artists because for me, art is by nature a human-centric because art for me, it's about human, for human, made by human. And I'm interested, what is the role of art in human-centricity of technology, in your opinion? 
I think there's a huge potential for art to open up a lot of questions that are not being asked in the uh, you know, technology or design or business world. Um, I think the, you know, a lot of times I think of art as not necessarily solving problems, but creating them, <laughs> um, which seems to be, I mean, I could argue that a lot of technology is also creating problems, but I think they like to think of themselves as solving them. <laughs> um, whereas artists have no misconception. <laughs> or creating them. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess for me, you know, when I think about art and why I'm, you know, because I started out in, in computer science and engineering, the reason I gravitated towards art, it's less, much less about the individual outputs or pieces and more about a way of just being in the world where, you know, I'm able to see, just see the um, systems and, and structures that are being built around us and ask why you know, why are these, why is this the rule spoken or unspoken? What happens if we bend it or shift it or subvert it or break it? And same with the, the technologies, which are really these like accumulations of, of rule systems, right? So it really fits with my contrarian nature, but I think there's a potential there with art to do that. And then there's also, I think a lot of pleasure to art, which again, I think I was mentioning this earlier, like if you read a critique of a technology, there's a way in which it can, or you, it's, there's a way in which you can feel like, okay, here's another thing I have to kind of grapple with or deal with, or, or I'm being told I, can't, I shouldn't use the thing I'm using. Whereas I think when you kind of lead, I'm always trying to find a certain amount of pleasure when people interact with the works or humor, it opens things up in a way where it's like, okay, there's a lot of problems here, but we could work through them together in a way that like, maybe even just that working through them could feel meaningful, yeah. could feel fulfilling. It's kind of fostering different conversations. It's interesting what you said, because I always say that the, the art and design often are kind of interrelated, they are overlapping. And for me, art, it's about formulating the questions. Design is about answering them. Yeah, I mean, questions maybe is a nicer word than problems. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's something very interesting because artists always lead for me by questions. Why? Why? And then the moment they discover why, so then the next question often is why not? Why it's not possible? I'm very much interested. Your work later date, it's something that you did during the pandemic? Yes. Can you share about it a bit? Sure. Yeah. It was just after everything kind of shut down around March. And I kept thinking about how everything was getting canceled and or postponed to later. And I kept thinking about how later had kind of taken on a new meaning. Like it, it had been elevated from, it used to be this place where we'd relegate anything that did not really concern us at the moment to the place where we were going to do everything. It wasn't clear when that later was. Was it in two weeks or in six months or eight, two years? So basically the piece, I built a web interface to facilitate a series of online chats with people. And so they would come and one-on-one, -on -one we would make a plan for a later date. When we were able to go outside again, where would we go? And I would sort of, it became sort of a fantasy, just being in the same space, being able to touch each other, shared surfaces, breathing, talking anything really. And it's kind of a performance in two parts. So the first part is that conversation and we're imagining where do we go? What will we do? What will we virtually. say? Virtually. The conversation takes place virtually. It's important yeah, to, virtually. to mention. Yeah, exactly. And also it's chat, it's text only. So it's not over Zoom or something. It's just typing. And then one day when we decide it's later, we actually meet up and we kind of reenact that, that script or that plan. So we go to the place, we say the things we're going to say, and we eat the foods we plan to eat or whatever. And that's that's part two of the, the performance. It reminds me, I don't know, I grew up before the era that computers were so pervasive. So we used to send letters. And normally this is what you would say, what will happen when you meet. You kind of plan the vacation and it's written on paper with ink and you send it in the mail, waiting for the response, waiting to it. Beautiful. So, uh, Lauren, we're getting into the end of the podcast, and I have one last question that I'm very much interested. What will be the role of humans in an AI machine learning environment, in your opinion? I'll just end on an easy one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think there is no better person to ask than you. I have a few ideas. 
One thing that I've been thinking a lot about is as you hear so much about jobs being replaced by AI or by machines, and I think what kinds of jobs will not be so easily replaced? I think what we're noticing is that all the ones that really require some emotional labor or affect, or like a teacher or a caretaker or a healthcare worker, these are ones that we're not so quick to wanting want to have like an AI take over for us. And it's interesting too because a lot of those jobs are often the some of the lower paid ones. So I guess I always the optimist despite my critical lens. So I'm always I'm hoping that maybe as AI increasingly has a role in our world, maybe we will start to realize how important those sorts of emotional roles actually are and, and give them the the importance and pay that they deserve. I've done a few projects where I was sort of like the emotional interface for an algorithm. So I was like receiving instructions from a piece of software I wrote via earpiece and I would like have to enact them, but with a human touch to it, right? So you don't feel like a computer is just talking to you. So I'm kind of intrigued by ideas like that where it's actually this collaboration. Right now, there's still a lot of conversations about AI versus human or where do we draw the lines or who's taking whose job. And I think as we get further into it, we realize it's so distributed that it, it will make less sense to talk about it as, is it this, is it a human or is it AI or something, but more just like how, what are the many layers in which these two systems <laughs> or, people, or we work with the, the systems around us in, in different ways. And I think there's potential for really exciting things and also a lot of concerns around just re-encoding some of the bias and, and problems we have in the world into these systems and perpetuating them. So those are those are the what I'm I'm curious to see how how do we move forward on that. Well, lucky we have artists like you that help us certain direction and show the po the potential of doing good with technology. Lorraine, thank you very very much. I really enjoyed our conversation. I definitely can continue and, and, and speak with you for, the, for another one hour. I hope you enjoyed as well. Yes, thank you. It was a pleasure. I hope that we can also do another hour, but I'm going to do it in real life like your sister in law. Yes. <laughs> Let's meet in real life. Lorraine, thank you very, very much. The conversation with Lorraine reinforced my conviction in the need for a discussion between art and technology between artists and technologists, and between every one of us, as humans, with the works of artists like Loren. After the conversation with Loren, I thought about Alexa that's standing in my living room. I look at it now and think about it more often. I still didn't take it out, but I am definitely more aware of its presence now. I will continue to think about these questions, and I hope you as well. So until you come back, I will be here waiting for you with another episode of the Artian Podcast. Once again, thanks for listening. Thanks again for choosing us, listening to us, and staying with us. Till now, we know that with so many content out there, you chose to listen to this one. So thank you for that. We are producing our podcast without any help. So if you find this valuable for you, I will be super grateful if you can help us spread the word by leaving a rating or a review. It will take you less than a minute and it's really, really valuable for us. Special thanks to Daniel Duran who mixed and mastered this episode and Abigail Dyson, our wonderful intern who helped us put this podcast out there. If you're interested in working with us and upskilling your team's capabilities, if you are looking to hone and develop an artistic mindset, then I would recommend you to check our workshops and training. All the information is available on our website. You can subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. Our previous shows are available on our website, www.theartian.com slash podcast. Each episode includes show notes, guest recommendations, videos, and other materials. We can also be found on our LinkedIn page, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. And you can reach us directly via email at podcast at theartian.com. Once again, thanks for listening. I will be here waiting for you on another episode of the Artian Podcast. Podcast.